What would it take to change your life right now? I'm not talking tomorrow. I'm not talking next week or in a month or when you retire or when you graduate or when you get married. I'm talking about right now. What would it take to change your life in this moment? And what would you be willing to do to see it happen? Well, I'm glad you said that. Because would $100,000 make a difference? Like, let's just say, hypothetically, there is $100,000 hanging in an envelope in a ceiling above us. Just <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> would that change your life? What if I told you that I'm going to give you the opportunity in this moment to obtain the contents of that envelope? You can't throw anything, but I'm going to give you five seconds. Go. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. You yeah, didn't win the $100,000. Don't worry about it. It was a fake check in my account. It would have bounced anyway. Uh, but, but here's my point. Do you ever feel like the thing that would change your life is so close and yet so far away. Do you ever get that sense that you've been reaching for something, looking for something, longing for something, but it seems so far out of reach? You want to change, you really do, but you just don't know how. Well, if that's you today, like me, you're in a great place because today I want to tell you something that will change everything for you. Not tomorrow, not in a week, not in a month, not in a year, but right now, if you will understand it, and it's called the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Jesus, in his very first sermon, we read it in Matthew chapter 4, his very first sermon was repent, for the kingdom of God is near. That word repent, I think sometimes we, we don't understand it. We think of beating ourselves with whips or something. That's what we think of repent is, you know. It, it's like getting your, rub nose, your nose rubbed in it, rubbed nose in it. I don't know. Either way, you, you, you understand. But the reality is this word that Jesus uses simply means to change. To change. To change the way you think. To change the way you live. To change your perception and to experience something completely different. And so he said, if you want to change... You have to embrace the kingdom of God. This message is so important to us here at Central that we're actually going to take the next three weeks to unpack it. In Matthew chapter 13, if, if you're not familiar with the Bible, that's okay. It isn't one book. It's actually 66 books compiled into one. And in one of these books, in what we call the New Testament, because the Bible is divided into two categories, the Old Testament, everything that was written before Jesus, and the New Testament, everything that was written after Jesus and during his time, in the New Testament, we read this word, kingdom of God, 100 times. It's important, and we need to understand it. And so Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, t has a sermon. It's, it's not his most famous sermon, but it's a sermon of six parables. And these six parables are broken down into three sets of two. And we're going to talk about each of those over the next few weeks. And so that's why I have this prop with me on the stage. What we're going to learn today is we're going to talk about the kingdom of God is like treasure. And then next week, we're going to talk about how to receive the kingdom by preparing your heart and then the final, we're going to talk about fishing, but I won't get too far ahead of myself. You want to come and be a part of that. But in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, we read the first two of these six parables about the kingdom of God. And if you understand this, it will change everything for you in this moment. So if you're looking for change, you're in the right place. And I've got great news for you. We call it the gospel, which simply means good news. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, we read Jesus saying, The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Here's what Jesus was saying in a nutshell. The kingdom of God is the one thing that changes everything. And so it's worth giving up everything to be a part of it. The kingdom of God is the one thing. It's the one thing you've been looking for. You didn't know it, 
maybe, but you are. You're looking for it. It's the one thing that is everything, and so it's worth giving up everything to experience it, to be a part of it. So let's unpack this, because again, sometimes in church we use words, and they sound good, and we think we know what they mean, but we have no clue. And so when it comes to the kingdom of God, I'll be honest, I had to do a little bit of research myself. What exactly is the kingdom of God? Is it some physical place? Is it heaven? Is it something we're trying to build a stairway to heaven, a uh, staircase to heaven, like Led Zeppelin said, too? Is it something that we've got to reach for? Is it, is it something here we're supposed to fight for? What is this kingdom? Well, the word kingdom in the original language in the Greek, when Jesus was using it, simply means the sphere of one's rule or reign. Literally, it just means the sphere of influence. It's your will. It's your will. Now, we all have been a part of a kingdom since we were born, whether you knew it or not. Now, you can, we're not a part of a kingdom, we're a democracy. Well, no, 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 but not in the, word that, the way that it's used here. You see, this is the sphere of your will, the ability to make choices and experience the rewards and consequences of those choices. So you've been a part of a kingdom. It's called yours, your kingdom. And let me prove it to you. When you were about two, maybe three years old, you learned some key words that you navigated and used all the time against your mother, okay? You may probably learned mama first and she loved you for it, but these two words, not so much. The very first word you learned was no, exactly. No, right? There's some painful moments here for moms. I know, they're like, yeah, why? Why? But here's exactly what you were saying. You were saying no to your kingdom, your rule and reign as my mother, and yes to my kingdom. No, you can't have influence. This is, and the second word we love, right, moms, is mine. This is mine. Now, what two or three-year-old comes up with that concept, that this is mine? Like, where did they, they didn't buy it, they didn't earn it. Are you kidding me? And as a parent, it's the most frustrating thing. No, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. It's like, no, it's not yours at all, right? But this is the kingdom of our will. We go, no, this is mine, that's yours. And we set territories and boundaries and we protect ours and attack others. It's the kingdom of this earth. And then we get a little bit older, right? And we have siblings and we sit in the backseat of the car and there's a territorial dispute, right? Whose side of the car is mine? And so parents, the king of the car, will sit back and draw a line in the middle and say, no, this is your territory and that's your territory and don't you dare cross the territory or you will get my territory, right? And so, so we understand this concept of, of will and kingdoms. And, and, I, and I wish I could say we grow out of it, but we don't. We just get more sophisticated, now what we do is we form alliances with our kingdom, with other kingdoms, and we hope that our wills combine. And so we form organizations, we form governments, we form churches in the attempt to have our will protected. Jesus says this is the kingdom of this world, and it's broken. It separates, it divides, it causes conflict and war and strife. And this kingdom isn't outside of you. It's actually inside of you. See, there's this myth that if we just change the outside, everything's going to be okay. But the problem isn't with the outside. The problem is the kingdom inside of you. It's the, rain, the raging inside of you that says, no, my will must be done. I want what I want. And if we could see inside of us sometimes, we're that little two-year-old going, no. Mine! This is the kingdom of this world. And sometimes we elect, and sometimes we promote, and sometimes we hire this thought. And it's destructive. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove to you that this kingdom exists in you and is destroying you. All right, don't raise your hand because it would be awkward. Okay, let's just be a family here and love each other, and we don't want to know it would be too much information. But if you are here, okay, how many of you have ever had a bad habit? Okay, no, as I said, don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever gossiped or stretched the truth? or withdrawn love from somebody because you didn't like what they did? How many of you have ever had conflict or been angry because someone cut you off? How many of you have ever experienced rage or disappointment? How many of you have been worried or anxious about the future? This is the war that rages, and it's a losing battle. The Bible reminds us that there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God, and those are the only two kingdoms that exist. 
And depending on who is the king in a kingdom depends on the nature of that nation. It's the sphere of rule and reign. So Jesus comes into this world and he actually has a plan. His plan is, I know you can't get up there. You can't get to this place because the kingdom of God is this place of peace and hope and joy. It's this uh, almost seemingly impossible dream. Jesus comes into this world and he doesn't just talk about it. He actually does it. He does it. People who are blind and lame, he heals and he reminds us that we are more than just our physical bodies. People who are outcast and no one will touch, he touches and embraces, reminding us that we are more than the social construction that we build around ourselves. He steps into our world and says that our value is not in what we possess, but in who possesses us. And he talks about this kingdom. He's like light in the darkness. And just like flicking on the lights early in the morning, it hurt our eyes. We didn't want to hear it. So we tried to kill him. But you can't kill love. You can't kill the king of kings, whose kingdom is without end. And so he said, listen, I know you can't get up there, so I'm going to bring it down here. The great news for us today is that following Jesus is not about getting to heaven it's about allowing Jesus to get heaven into us. The great thing about following Jesus is that not we're, ha- we're not hanging on so one day we can get up there. No, it's believing that he's bringing up there down here and we can live in it now. The beautiful thing about following Jesus is that we don't have to give in to the world system, the kingdoms of this world. We can have a revolution of the heart and believe the best and see the best right here, right now by surrendering to him as our king. And so this is why Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not when I get to heaven, but on earth as it is in heaven. It's why Jesus, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, not my will, but yours be done. This is the kingdom of God. And when you understand it, you want it. It's like treasure that you've stumbled across and realize it is more valuable than anything else you've ever heard or ever been told. And so you sell everything to get it. And so how do you get into this kingdom? That's the journey we're going to be on for the next three weeks. It's going to be awesome. But it starts by changing your heart. It starts by repenting, by simply acknowledging that I can't rule and reign my own life. This kingdom that I'm a part of is not what I need. I need to be a part of the kingdom of God and allowing Jesus to become king. And this is good news. So what is it worth to you? What is it worth to you to change today? I hope you agree with me that it's worth everything because the kingdom of God is the one thing that will change everything. And so it's worth giving up everything to be a part of it. My name is Jen. And I'm Nathan. And we've been married eight years now, about five or about five years into our marriage, so about three years ago, almost exactly, our life took a radical turn when we tripled our family size through adoption. We brought home a sibling group of four uh, between the ages of eight and six. And then just in the last two and a half months, we decided to add a fifth to our family who is two years old now. Family to me pretty much means chaos. I feel like all day long, I'm tripping over toys and breaking up squabbles and planning the next fun activity and getting asked 10,000 times when that activity is happening, even if I've answered it every time before that, and having a lot of fun. The minivan has eight seats. We have our two daughters and our two-year-old who sits in the middle between them. We call him Switzerland. He is neutral territory, and the two fighting girls are kept calm and (laughs) at peace because Switzerland is in the middle. And then we have two boys in the back. So we do have room for one more. Um, (laughs) Doesn't mean we have to fill that seat. (laughs) I know who you talk to. (laughs) 
but uh, yeah. <laughs> When we had first brought our kids home, I would lie awake in bed in the middle of the night, staring at the ceiling, going, oh my goodness, I have just adopted four kids. It's definitely not the Von Trapp family, where, you know, trauma or this, you know, this loss or trauma has happened in their life and that they're grateful that they have, you know, a loving home and parents because for the longest time, they haven't had loving home and parents, and they have frustration and angers towards those hurt. And for the most part, they exert and take out their frustration and hurts on, on us. One of our kids, a few months after they came home, was finishing up a bath, and I went in to get that child dried off and into their jammies and stuff, and. Um, the bathroom was completely flooded, like water up to my ankles. My child said to me, did you notice what I did? I said, oh, you did this. And the child kept scooping water out of the bathtub and throwing it on the ground right in front of me and said to me, which I thought was very intuitive, but sad, I'm doing this so you'll get rid of me. If I keep damaging the house and destroying things, then you'll have to get rid of me. And I know now that that same child knows that they're here to stay. I, I don't think anything I've done previous to this, adopting four kids and then adding another one a little later, has grown my faith in ways that I never dreamed possible. I need to depend on God, because there's a lot of moments raising five kids who've come from really hard places where I have no idea what to do. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, I need God's help to help me be the mom that my kids need me to be. So taking this step of faith has, has grown my faith exponentially in ways that I can't even imagine or didn't imagine before. Yeah, that, that first step was, was hard, but it was completely worth it. I think one of the few examples for me that was worth it was um, Valentine's Day. The first one I wanted to continue a tradition that Jens had, had done where he would just give his daughter roses and wish them a happy Valentine's Day. And I really appreciated that tradition and wanted to do that for our daughters. So I brought, I brought home Jen some roses and I brought each of the girls a rose. And my one daughter looks at the, the rose. She doesn't know it's hers yet. She goes, oh, is that, is that rose for mom? Said, I said, no, that rose is for you, honey. And the joy on her face and just the way her jaw dropped. To see that she was loved and appreciated and got a gift like that, she had probably had never received before. I think that God puts these desires, even just small ones, on our hearts. And it's up to us to respond to those desires. We can, yeah, for Jen, it was a desire to adopt and to, you know, have add children in our family through adoption. And it was up to her and I to say, to say yes to that. And, but I think we get to our, our bigger or greater calling when we say yes to the small callings and desires that God puts on our hearts. Isn't that a great story? I just wanted to thank you for allowing us to share your story for a couple of reasons. The first reason is pretty obvious. Uh, you're an inspiration of what can happen when two people decide to change, um, not only themselves, but the world around them. But the other thing that inspires me about your story is it is really a reflection of the kingdom of God, that when we feel like we're on the outs, when we feel broken and battered and like nobody cares, God adopts us and he loves us. And he says, actually, I'm going to bring you a part of something bigger than yourself. And that word repent is a fascinating word because it just means to change. It means changing the way you think about yourself and about the God who made you. 
And so just you've been an inspiration in that regard that if you're here today and you feel like you're on the outside looking in and you're looking for something, you're reaching for something, you can just know today that there's a God who absolutely loves you unconditionally and just wants to bring you back into his family. But the question I think about practically is, why? I mean, really, I know, I know, it sounds like a bad question, but you're young, you're just kind of newly married, and you take on this massive responsibility. Your life dramatically changes. It's not like you gradually grow into a family. It's like, there they are. So, so why did you do it? Well, I think it goes back to high school for me, where um, I really struggled and wrestled with the idea that life's not fair. I had a great life, a great childhood, and... Um, was loving life, but saw a lot of pain around me uh, through my friends, through some loss, uh, and struggled with knowing why is life not fair. And Pastor Bill was becoming my youth pastor temporarily at that time and sat me down to talk to me because I was really wrestling with, even if I was going to follow God at this point, and um, told me, yeah, life's not fair. Wrestle with that, but figure out how you can start making changes around you now to make it just that little bit more bit more fair. And so from there, um, adoption, kind of this dream of adoption birthed in my heart. And um, before I got married to Nathan, I warned him slash uh, <laughs> let him know that this was something really important to me. And he's amazing and was on board, no problem with that. And so we knew adoption was going to be a part of growing our family. We just couldn't quite imagine to the extent. <laughs> it's awesome. And that, and that is great marriage advice as well. <laughs> Husbands just say, yes, dear. Okay. Um, so, Nathan, um, tell me what you've learned about God in this whole journey. One of the biggest things I've learned is with, with adoption and, and seeing the hurt in my kids and yeah, what they go through, and as a parent, that God's love is, is always unconditional, and he's always pursuing no matter what. And, and where I am today, like... I'm not, I'm not anyone special. I'm not, I'm just a normal guy going to work, trying to support his wife and kids. And it's amazing how yeah, God can do that. And then, yeah, I'm living the gospel every day. I gotta give that unconditional love and that patience and continually pursue my kids because they've never done that or have never felt that. And with living the gospel every day, I can't help but change and be changed by it. It's awesome. So my last question is, maybe there's someone here and they want to change. They really do. And they've been inspired by something that has been said today or some thought that has come to them. What would you encourage them to do if, if they want to change? How can they experience that today? Well, Nathan mentions in the video just saying yes. And I think that's how we got here today um, where we didn't set out to adopt five kids from the start. We had no idea that that's where God was leading us, but we started saying yes. Yes to following God, first of all, both of us in our own journeys. Yes to going off to school and having God speak to us while we're there. Yes to marriage to each other. Yes uh, to, okay, let's adopt. Yes, let's adopt from foster care. Yes, let's adopt siblings. And all those series of yeses ended up where we are today. So I really encourage you, the first step can be hard and it can be lonely at times because sometimes you don't see the people in front of you that you can follow with that step, but you need to take it. And uh, so I really encourage you to say yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you've been such uh, a blessing to our family. For those of us who know you and love you, uh, your story is inspired and I've had the privilege of seeing your journey for quite a while. And so we just wanted to bless you. And we can only imagine how challenging it is as a young family with all these new kids and responsibilities. And so we just wanted to do something as a tangible way of blessing as a church family. And so we've decided to give you just a little bit of something to help you in the journey, a uh, check for $2,000. And so, so can you just thank, thank the Paris Dollars? And so, yeah, let's bless them. Thank you. I love you guys. Thanks, man. Yeah, God. And so today has all been about change, and we've done everything we've done today actually for you. Whether you're watching online and you didn't anticipate coming online, but you did today, or someone invited you and you joined them, or whether you came here for the very first time, I believe God brought you to this moment to bring change into your life. 
And I know you've been trying. Maybe you've been trying really hard, and you've thought, man, if I could just do a little bit better, I can reach it. I'm here to tell you the great news is you don't have to reach anymore. God reached down to you. And he's not trying to make us good enough to get to heaven. He's trying to bring heaven down to us and change us, and in so doing, change the world. And so if you're here today and you're ready for that change, I want to just give you a couple of options that are available to you to begin that journey. The very first thing is that we believe that God has given us a roadmap. It's called the Bible. And that roadmap leads us back into what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And so we've, uh, we have this new Bible. It's called Word. It's, it's the Bible, but it's in a magazine format. So it's really kind of cool. And if you've never owned a Bible, you're here, you're new for the very first time, or you don't have a Bible, we'd love to put this into your hands. And so how you can get that to begin your journey is just go out these doors to the big blue wall, Central Connect, and someone will meet you and be happy to give you one of these today. Or maybe you're here and you want an, a next step. You, you're ready. You kind of, you've already made the decision to follow Jesus, but you want to take that next step. We do have a class called Next Step steps, and we'd like you to sign up for that today. You can do that again at the, at the great big blue wall. Um, or if you're here today and you just need someone to talk to, maybe today you're ready to say yes. You don't even understand fully, but you're just ready to say yes. I want you to know that there's a prayer team that's going to be here in just a moment that would love to pray with you and talk to you about anything. Or again, you can go to the great big blue wall called Central Connect and meet somebody there. But I just want you to know that, that we're on your side. We're fighting with you. And we're not asking you to join the church. We're asking you to join the kingdom of God. Because when you really understand it, it's worth giving up everything to be a part of it. And so today I bless you. I bless you with the truth that, yes, this world is broken. It's true. Yes, this world is not always fair. Yes, it is true that our will is often not strong enough to accomplish the desires we have in our heart. But I bless you with the truth that into that darkness, the light has come, and he has a name, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is willing to step into your life and show you a new way to live, to invite you into the kingdom of God. You no longer need to be stuck in the kingdom of this world and its thinking. You can be free today. And so live in that freedom and if you're here today and you want to make that change, just make it. Make the decision to say yes to him. And if you are here and you're a part of the kingdom, then could I encourage you to continue to live in it, pursue it. Because like treasure, when you find it, it's worth giving up everything to be a part of it. And so on this day, I bless you with the truth that God is willing to change any who ask. I bless you in the name of the Father. I bless you in the name of the Son. And I bless you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.